Good evening, everybody. You're so welcome. Thank you for joining us for the fifth episode of Conversion Therapy and You. This evening, we're going to be talking about the UK's Memorandum of Understanding and what has led up to that document and its status at the point at which the country wants to go towards banning therapeutic choice or so-called conversion therapy. Now there's a point. Welcome, Laura, my friend and colleague from California. Hi, Mike. Good to see you. And here in the U.S., we're still uh, our national therapy ban bill is still stuck on hold because one Democrat won't vote for it. And I hear, interestingly, that in Canada, conservative MPs are filibustering their national uh, therapy ban bill. Okay, well, thank the Lord for that one Democrat and for those busy in Canada, I would say. Here's the point, Laura, that I wanted to make. We've called this series Conversion Therapy and You, not because we're in love with the term conversion therapy, but simply because it is a term that is being increasingly and commonly used, and we want to interact with the term. But of course, when people are wanting to ban conversion therapy, it's really about banning therapeutic choice from our point of view. Anyway, it's great to have you, uh, folks. Thank you for being here. I have a special guest this evening. We do. Um, Dr. Karis Mosley. Karis, it's so good to have you. Thank you so much for being with us today. Yes, thanks for inviting me. Good to see you, Karis. Yes, um, good evening, Laura. We're going to be watching an interview that we did a little earlier, so we're looking forward to that, but it would be great if you could stick around and just help us to summarize and maybe catch some of the things that no doubt we will miss. But let's get into it now, folks. Um, I wanted to perhaps just encourage us to look back at what was happening in the UK in 2012 and 13. Do you remember this? Have a look at this video. When the mayor banned this poster, the Christian group behind the not gay and proud message accused him of trying to secure the gay vote ahead of his re-election. Today, the Court of Appeal said there should be an investigation. Well, I think it's a very important uh, judgment today because what we see happening here is the master of the roles, a very senior judge, ordering that a senior politician, the Mayor of London, Boris Johnson, be investigated for potential unlawful interference um, in, in, a, in, in order to advance his political campaign. At an event to promote buses today, Boris Johnson seemed unnerved by the court's decision. I, I saw that and as far as I understand it they've supported uh, what we decided to do and that's great and as far as I'm concerned that's, uh, that's, that's, uh, that's good news. The row began after the gay rights group Stonewall ran banners on double-decker buses reading some people are gay get over it. Court issues argued the posters went against their Christian beliefs and announced plans for theirs but as chairman of TfL Boris Johnson imposed the ban. His decision came just ahead of the 2012 mayoral elections and the Christian group claims he personally intervened and acted for an improper purpose. But even the mayor's political opponents say he did do the right thing. I think Boris was absolutely right to take the decision he did. He is the head of transport for London and whilst the posters were not themselves advocating violence against lesbians or gays, that sort of thing can trigger that very small minority of violent people to go out and do something like that. Well, it's obviously a legal technicality, but quite honestly, on the issue itself, I think there's going to be very few people who wouldn't say that TfL and Boris, in this instance, did absolutely right. What started as a row over censorship has ended up with the Court of Appeal ordering an inquiry. The key phrase from both sides of this row was get over it. It's unlikely anyone will be doing that for some time to come. Ron K. Phillips, ITV News. Well, I'm joined now by Dr. Mike Davidson from the Core Issues Trust. Thank you for coming in to speak to me. We know that when an election campaign is happening, whether that's on a local level or nationally, 
politicians target specific groups. In the next election, they're targeting the so-called Aldi mum. So even if it is proven that Boris Johnson did target the gay vote, what's, what's the problem with that? Well, I think they need to be even-handed. So fair enough, if they have a particular target, then surely they need to uh, give some attention to people who have a different point of view. We're just interested in a balanced debate. This is a very complex area. It can't be easily settled. We need to have good evidence in front of us and we need an opportunity to speak what we believe to be true. But what happened in court today didn't change the ruling that it was OK to ban the advert. So nothing's going to change from, from this action, is it? Well, I disagree because I think, in, in a sense, it was a clear recognition that people who are moving away from homosexuality or who have an, what they call an ex-gay identity are people who need to be respected within our democracy. They are recognised. But the court didn't say that. It didn't say that it was looking into whether that type of language, that type of phrase that a lot of people find very offensive, should be out there on the streets. It said that it was looking into why the mayor decided to make that ban because of your accusations that he did it to get the gay vote. I think what the court did say was that there is a problem if public figures misuse their power and that it's very important to discern what is going on in such a situation and that's welcome news. But so many people supported the mayor on, on this one. We've seen today from his political opponents. That speaks volumes, doesn't it? And TfL saying today in, in a statement reiterating the fact that it breached their advertising standards. I think Judge Lang made it very clear that in her opinion it was not only the Core Issues Trust advert that breached uh, those uh, principles, it was also the Stonewall advert, it was also the British Humanist Society. So buses, I don't really think, are the place to get a reasoned account for all of the complexities you, in this. You're obviously entitled to your views. When you use the phrase ex-gay, do you ever think about a young child or a teenager coming to terms with his or her homosexuality? and having to, to listen to words like that and what effect it might have on them if they have a different opinion to you. And what about the married man who experiences homosexual feelings and goes for support from a counsellor and is told, well, actually, there's nothing that can be done. You really should reconsider your marriage. But he, with his partner and perhaps with his children, has decided that that is a personal priority for him and that's what he wants to do. Why should he not be supported and respected as an autonomous individual? OK, I think that slightly diverts what we were talking about. But Dr Mike Davidson, thank you very much for coming in to talk to me on this issue. Thank you. You're welcome. And you probably remember the story that we had three uh, opportunities in the High Court to try to move towards a judicial review. We went through an appeal before the highest judges in the land uh, and some very significant political points were scored, but in the end, Transport for London were not in any way um, discouraged from the position that they had taken. Now, I want to progress that story a little bit and look at it in detail because it's about this time that the memorandum of understanding is beginning to be formulated. And I think it's very important that we get to grips with that. But now, folks, I think we need to change the focus. We'll know that in this series, we've been taking a step back in time into the world of the ancients. And the reason why we're doing this is because I feel it's a useful context to look at the whole notion of evidence and the, the, the interaction between ideological viewpoint and perspective and how we use evidence. And I thought that if we look at this particular example, this question of whether or not there were believers in the ancient city before the eruption, and we look at how archaeologists assess that and what evidence they use, that it might help us to uncover some of the very important principles that relate to investigation, evidence, and the danger of ideology uh, just forcing us to stay with within one particular viewpoint. So. We're going to go a little bit deeper this evening and we're going to look at 
what I think are fascinating evidences of um, possible Christian activity in early Pompeii. And I just want to make this point before we look at this video. You will hear a lot about apotropaic symbols. And for those of you who need to be reminded, apotropaic simply means having the ability to chase away evil spirits. So um, in many cultures, and particularly in Roman society, in a society where there was no police force, where poor people were not regulated in any particular way except by their slave masters, there was a great deal of superstition. And we think what happened is that Christians used these little crosses on the streets to attempt to protect themselves in various residences and in, in their places of work. Uh, and we'll talk about it a little bit more at the end of the video, but just take a look at this with an open mind and let's see where it goes. Before we leave this part of the city, it's well worth visiting the Temple of Isis. Built in the second century, the temple and cult was popular in the seaport of Pompeii, whose residents relied on the sea and validated any deity that could control the power of the ocean. Isis offered protection in sailing, navigable seas, an abundant life and afterlife in exchange for personal devotion. Neptune had been an unpredictable, fearful deity, but Isis replaced him in the devotion of many Pompeians. I'm on my way now to spend some time considering the evidence for Jesus' devotion in this Vesuvian town. The term Jesus' devotion recognizes that some Jews were devoted to Jesus, as were the Christians. The Christianus inscription, for example, found in a large inn in Pompeii, is the earliest pre-eruption existing reference to corporate Christians, indicating at the very least that someone visiting the city knew of their existence. This is a complex inscription, and here's why. In the late second century, Tertullian, a Christian theologian, claimed that there were no Christians in the region of Campania at all. But this is contradicted by Acts chapter 28, describing Paul's visit to nearby Putoli in AD 60 with Jesus' devotees at the synagogue there. The Christianus inscription seems to point to the existence of a community of Jesus' devotees referred to as Christians. The Vive Graffito is a Region 1 inscription that has received little attention. It contains the letters VIV from the Latin vivere, to live. The graffito also contains a cross shape, which together with the viv stem make it intriguing. Some have argued that the letters find completion in the graffito, with the top part of the cross representing the letter I, and the lower part of the T making the word vivit, which means he, she, or it lives. Combining letters in this way as a ligature is found in other inscriptions, but the point is, this may well be another Christian inscription. It's evident that some people interpret this as a Christian inscription, but others disagree. But now, let's take a look at another set of inscriptions about which there will be some controversy. The little street crosses, such as this, to be found at one of the town's intersections and along the streets. What I want to point out is that these equilateral crosses were sometimes found near the street shrines important to pagan citizens of Pompeii. Is it that in their own way, both were apotropaic, designed to ward off evil spirits? There is precedent for using the streets of Pompeii to convey messaging. Dating inscriptions, for example, are to be seen on the curbstones, but Romans were also keen on warding off evil by placing dogs and boors at the front door. And then, of course, seen throughout Pompeii were the ever-present phallic symbols for good luck. But I'm interested in finding out more about the little street crosses. One of the interesting facts about this street is that further down the road is to be found the ruins of the home of Terentius Neo, the baker, seen in a famous portrait with his wife, 
and found in this home was the second copy of the Rota Square, which some believe had Christian or Jewish significance. But I'm on the trail of the little crosses and heading for a location that might well have been a center for Jesus' devotion in Region 6 of Pompeii. Hopefully, you'll be observing that, depending on how we analyze and interpret these finds, there may well be a case for a Christian and Jewish presence in the town. Along this road, there are a further four street crosses that are apotropaic outside residences and at intersections, but at the corner bakery, there is a link between the tiny street cross number six and a cross found prominently displayed on the wall of the bakery. We're outside the baker shop in the Ariana Apollyana, and behind me on the wall was the site where a famous cross was found. It's been disputed in archaeological circles as to whether or not it was actually a first century Christian artifact. But the interesting thing is it's linked to a tiny equilateral cross that has been inscribed into one of the paving stones on the corner in the middle of the street, right near a modern day marker peg. The important thing about this is that the tiny cross on the road, in the middle of the road, links to 10 other crosses that begin in further up the road at the Herculaneum Gate and progress in this direction towards the Via Stabiana. The really interesting thing is this bakery has another cross behind it, as though in a way it's been encircled or it's almost protected by these symbols that are believed to be apotropaic. In other words, they would have warded off evil spirits. There were two more crosses on the road towards the Herculaneum Gate, which we'll refer to as crosses three and four. But it's worth remembering, it would not have been advisable in ancient days to walk along the roads as we are now, or even possible. Much better to stick to the sidewalk. This is because ancient roads were natural sewers and traffic would have been very heavy. It also means that these crosses were not direction givers, but were truly apotropaic. This is the place at which the road came out of the city of Pompeii on its way to Herculaneum and to Naples. And at my feet is another example of what's believed to be an early first Christian century apotropaic symbol. It's important to know that Roman graves were always outside of the city, probably for many practical reasons, but also for spiritual reasons. People were concerned about spirits entering through the normal traffic and entryways that were dedicated for carts and for pedestrians. There is indeed a cross on the right-hand side where the carts would have come, and on the other side, in the pedestrian pathway on the inside of the city. And I'm standing where the pedestrians would have gone out of the city. And again, on the second slab near the base of the arch here is quite a large cross. It's a very interesting thing that there's one on the side at which the carts would enter the city and one on the inside of the city when pedestrians would enter the city. Crosses 1 and 2 at the Herculaneum Gate certainly give credence to the role of the street crosses in the early Roman mindset of believers. But how do we know that these are ancient marks? We now need to return to the bakery at the Ariana Polyana, where cross number 6 is found near a modern-day street marker to answer this question. Some people will find that a plausible explanation, perhaps, of these marks. Others will totally repudiate it. But how do we progress this? How do we deal with this? You'll need to keep watching to be able to make your own assessment. But I would point you to the work of Bruce Longenecker. His books are found on Amazon. He's done a great deal of work. And I think you will agree, if you read the books, that he has some extremely important points to make in terms of how the evidence is being used and disused in this particular context. We're going to change focus again and go back to the memorandum of understanding. Uh, and uh, I'm looking forward to interacting with 
others in a few minutes, but I'd like us to just take a look at this report that Christian Concern filed during the bus case. After Core Issues Trust had its London bus poster campaign banned, the Christian ministry has taken its case to the High Court, claiming that London Mayor Boris Johnson denied them the freedom to express their views. The trust director, Dr Mike Davidson, who is ex-homosexual, had entered into a contract with Transport for London to run the advertisements on 24 buses, reading Not Gay, Ex-Gay, Post-Gay and Proud, Get Over It. The campaign was in response to the Stonewall posters that appeared on 1,000 London buses that said some people are gay, get over it. Mayor Johnson intervened to stop the not gay advertisements just hours before they were due to become public, claiming they would cause offence to homosexuals and possibly result in violence against the Christian community. Speaking outside the High Court, Dr Davidson said regardless of the outcome of the case, he hoped it would highlight the need to be able to offer help to those who face same-sex attraction. If we get the recognition that there is a group of people within UK society who chooses to move away from homosexuality, and therefore they are a group, just as we have gay groups in the country, I think that that's an important achievement. This case has sparked considerable media interest, including a live interview with Sky News. And so your posters, what were they trying to say to people? We're trying to establish the fact that in the UK there is a, a population group who legitimately want to move away from homosexuality. And that's not uh, trying to be rude or discourteous to people who have another take on life. So what do these students at the Centre for Missional Leadership think about this case? You know, it's all about equal opportunities, but then actually Christ Christians aren't given the equal opportunity to stand for what they believe in in the public sphere. You can't say, all right, then people are allowed to say their opinion and then not let another group of people say, say their opinion. And if you have a freedom to express any opinion that you hold, then surely anyone should be able to put an opinion on a bus. If it especially if it's just the opposite opinion. I think we've either got freedom of speech in this country or we've not. If it's okay for somebody to proclaim something uh, very much one way, saying that um, homosexuality is right and it should be accepted, then we should have freedom of speech to say the opposite. And Dr Davidson is challenging all Christians to recognise the need to support those who want to change from their feelings of same-sex attraction. We really need uh, to stand the ground and stand true to the Word of God and to be supportive of men and women who choose not to identify as gay and who work uh, to move away from it. So, Laura. Uh, I don't know what you, your thoughts are. Uh, I'm not even sure if you were aware at the time that that was happening way back in 2012. Do you remember that yes. at all? Yes, we were aware of this in the United States and in and, and our professional organization of therapists who are uh, open to a client's goal of change and sexual attraction. We were very, very interested in what was happening. Um, and, you know, I want to go back to some one of the earlier clips uh, where an in, uh, media asked you or somebody asked you, what about a boy who's growing up um, and sees this opportunity for change? Um, I think that the, the point of view expressed there is as though uh, sexual orientation is baked in, maybe at birth, maybe biologically determined, it could never change. People don't have a choice about what they do. And I think the message that's being that's being given from that perspective is that this boy has no choice. Not, not only exactly. that the married man who wants to save his marriage and family has no choice to have support or help to explore his options, but the boy has no is being told he has no options. He's locked in. He has one way he can he, he's permitted to live. Uh, to think about it, and there is no room for any uh, fluidity or change potentially, which is not true. He may also be attracted to both sexes. This isn't even considered an option. He doesn't even know that. He may think if he has any same-sex attraction, 
that means he's only same sex attracted. Um, and, and so, uh, yes, I'm concerned about that boy who's being locked, locked in and told he has no exactly. options. Oh, that's right, Laura. We're going to pick this up as we go on. But I wanted to point out the fact that isn't it interesting that at the time, uh, the current prime minister of the UK, Boris Johnson, was then uh, going for re-election as the mayor of London. And I think what was of concern to us at the time was he said, I've banned it. <laughs> and he took ownership of the fact that our 24 uh, buses were not going to be able to display this um, banner that we had. But the thousand buses that Stonewall had put their ad adverts, of course, could um, rumble on through the streets of London during the Olympics. And then when it came to the court case, as we would see, we will see later on, um, Boris said, no, it wasn't him at all. He didn't ban it. He was just expressing an opinion. So for us, this is very um, instructive in terms of the way uh, things uh, have been working in this area in the UK. Can we just take a look, a look at this clip now? Because unfortunately, uh, the whole thing then became quite um, embroiled in controversy. And uh, well, take a look at this clip, see what you think. It began as a run over censorship. Now it's headed for the courts. The campaign group Stonewall started it with its bus adverts exhorting people with anti-gay views to get over it. Then a Christian group retaliated with posters pushing the line that therapy can change your sexual orientation before also adding, get over it. The Christian adverts have been banned, Stonewalls have not. Cue the courts. As Parak O'Brien reports, it looks like no one involved is getting over it anytime soon. You wait for a controversy. The week before last, these ads appeared on the sides of London buses. Last week, an evangelical Christian group called Anglican Mainstream said they wanted to put this ad on buses. Yesterday, Boris Johnson banned the ad. Gay rights groups are delighted. I think if this advert had appeared in a different place, people might not be so exercised about it. But in London, in the public space, where young people who might be struggling with their sexuality could see it and think that they might you know, be diseased as gay people, I think that's deeply inappropriate. Today, the Christian group who believe God can make gay people straight said they'd bring legal action. I think there are issues about freedom of speech here that need to be looked at very carefully. This censorship is a very unhealthy sign in our society, in my opinion. So what happens next? Well, the solicitors write to Boris Johnson asking him to lift the ban and explain the rationale behind it. If he doesn't do that, a judge has to decide whether this actually warrants a judicial review in court or not. Things will upset people, things will cause people great pain, but that's simply not enough to say that, you know, that we can protect people from every single bad idea or every single upsetting idea. Why do you think Boris did it then? There must be an element of electioneering about this. We put this to Team Boris Johnson and are awaiting a reply. There's a hustings event organised by Stonewall for all London mayoral candidates tomorrow. This may turn out joining a list of similar cases, the British Airways crucifix case, the Biddeford Council prayers one, now the gay bus ad case. So what do all of these cases have in common? Well, for one thing, they have the same team of lawyers. Another thing, they very rarely actually win. And finally, they generate acres and acres of column inches about how persecuted some Christians feel. You couldn't buy this level of publicity now that it's been banned. We couldn't. One has to wonder if God is not perhaps um, active in this. It wasn't our intention to provoke this situation. We are astonished it has. Um, the publicity is obviously good. It'll be interesting to see how this row plays in the run-up to the mayoral election. But with God on your PR team, play, it probably will. I'm interested in getting your perspective, Laura, but one thing that strikes me there is the role that the media played in kind of 
uh, positioning the narrative around this. I don't know if you noticed that the newscaster said that we were saying that, um, you know, in our slogan that this was about therapy. But of course, that was not in our minds. All we were simply doing is saying that there is, you know, a, there is in the United Kingdom groups of people who were gay. Uh, we, we could have just said that. Some people were gay. Get over it. Uh, that's what we were saying at that time. But immediately, the link is made to therapy. And then you saw Andy... Um, Wasley, I think his name is from Stonewall, picked up on the fact that this was saying that people are diseased. Um, and then you saw the commentator at the end saying, you know, they all have the same group of lawyers, they never win any cases, and they generate acres and acres of material about Christians being persecuted. So I'm very interested in the role of media and of course, Stonewall is very much in the news. But do you have a take on what you've seen? Yes, well, I think that that is documentation that, that uh, Christians and people who choose other options about their sexuality are, are being persecuted, frankly, um, that they're being silenced, they're, <clears throat> they're being, <clears throat> excuse me, maligned. Um, and, you know, in the process, yes, it's true, we are getting our message out in a way uh, with the help of our opponents in a way we could never do ourselves. That also is true. Fair enough. Now, uh, somebody who has played a key role in all of this is Andrea Williams, the CEO of the Christian Legal Center. And she was very much with us in all three cases in front of the High Court. Um, and she expressed a view. Take a look at this clip. Uh, this case uh, is a very serious case, a very important case, and it strikes right at the heart of our freedom of speech uh, here in the United Kingdom. And uh, it's a sad day in many ways, a sad day for freedom. We, what we have is a public official, Boris Johnson, very clearly giving two opposite versions of what happened with regard to these bus adverts. In April 2012, he took all the credit, he made the statement, I pulled those adverts, I instructed for those adverts to be pulled. But here to this court, he made a clear statement saying that he didn't do that, uh, that he was just merely expressing an opinion. The judge uh, refused our application uh, to cross-examine him on what he really meant by the word instruct. And what are we left with? We're left with the, the judge then almost bending over backwards, doing academic somersaults to say, that uh, he didn't, when he said instruct, he didn't really mean instruct, he was just giving an opinion. We're going to appeal. Boris Johnson, Mrs Justice Lang, they have not uh, seen the last of this. They really haven't. Because it's a really important case for freedom of speech and for tr the transparency of our public officials, our political officials, and indeed the court, the judiciary. If you'd ever said to me when I was a young barrister that I would be calling into question the transparency of our judicial system, I think I'd have laughed. But what we see here in the face of evidence that is black and white, that cannot uh, be interpreted in any other way, contemporaneous emails, sworn oaths to the court is contradictory statements which the judge chooses not to probe or make excuses for. It's opaque. We won't give up here. And so we went towards an appeal, um, having, in a sense, lost that first part of the battle. And uh, we're going to follow that through in a few minutes when we hear from Andrea Williams in a pre-recorded interview that we did earlier. But you know what struck me um, listening to that again, uh, Laura, is the fact that, you know, times have really changed. And this constant appeal to authority, um, that the authorities say that this is it, I mean, it seems to me that it's losing credibility, and especially in post-Brexit Britain, uh, when, you know, the nation stood up 
against Parliament, so to speak, or against politicians and said, we're not going to go in that direction. And I wonder if we are not going to see the erosion of confidence in so-called experts who don't prove themselves to be doing the right thing when it comes to following the science behind all of this. We claim to be a nation that follows the science in all, all our dealings with COVID during the pandemic. But are we doing that in relation to sexuality? We simply make statements about various mental health bodies and seem to think that that's enough and we ignore um, the empirical evidence. What do you say, Laura? Well, I think people are seeing that um, the courts and media are not unbiased, that they are activists sometimes and they are biased by their cultural values or worldviews. And I hope they're seeing that about science now and the professional uh, organizations or guilds or clubs. Um, the professional organizations definitely are following cultural uh, biases or values. Um, we know in the United States there is uh, there was research showing that most people who are mental health professionals um, are less religious than the general population. We also see from the political actions and, and positions of the organizations that they are more left of center and progressive than um, they're far, they're, uh, consistently, I would say, having been a member of the American Psychological Association over 40 years, I would say consistently on an issue, they come down on a progressive cultural perspective. This is not scientifically objective. It's, a, it's just opinions. And, you know, I think it's also scapegoating, um, in a way, um, passing the buck, Laura, because, of course, it was the professional medics who were busy with the electroshock and techniques, nothing to do with the church or with ministries that were involved in this. They had their problems. But to try and pass the buck now and to make a conversion therapy something that belongs only outside of the professional domain is to just ignore what happened in history. Now, we're going to hear from Dr. Christopher Rosick, and apologies that I didn't platform this right at the beginning of this program. Christopher Rosick is an outstanding researcher, licensed psychologist who does a lot of counseling and psychotherapeutic work, a resident in California. But he's done an enormous amount of peer-reviewed research and scholarship that is worthy of attention. And we're going to be hearing directly from him in a few minutes. But right now, let's turn to the CEO of the Christian Legal Center, Andrea Williams. Good morning, Andrea. It's lovely to see you. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. Would you just introduce yourself briefly, even though we don't really need an introduction, but it's good to hear it for those who haven't met you before. I'm Andrea Williams and I'm Chief Executive of Christian Concern and the Christian Legal Centre. Andrea, the Christian Legal Centre supported Core Issues Trust um, a long time ago over the London, what we call the London bus case. This was Transport for London versus Core Issues Trust. And uh, you supported us actually through many years. Thank you so much for doing that. I want to say, Michael, as I've been reading through um, the case this morning and refreshing my mind, and it dates right back to 2012. We were still in the appeal courts in 2014. It was an extraordinary endeavor and very much ahead of its time. As we see what's coming about in the public space right now, particularly with regard to Stonewall, the grip that Stonewall had on the advertising industry, the, the grip that Stonewall had on Boris Johnson when he was going for mayor at that time, quite extraordinary. And as at the moment we begin to see Stonewall beginning to disintegrate and questions being asked, we can see that we were asking those questions back in 2012. We were subject to the discrimination. You specifically were subject to the discrimination and the favoring of Stonewall and this progressive, harsh ideology. Um, you were 
right at the heart of challenge it way back then. So, there is a, there is a certain timelessness, isn't there, and something quite prophetic in a yeah. way in yeah. terms of the issues that were addressed there. But Andrea, I wanted to um, just ask you, coming from a legal point of view and in your capacity as CEO also of um, the Christian Legal Centre, what do you think is the significance of the ruling from the then from from the bus case because of the intervention? on behalf of Maria Miller, then Minister of Equalities? Well, they were forced to intervene, but what I want to say is that the presidential value of what was gained as a result of your case, Michael, is extremely significant, has remained very significant since 2014, when the Court of Appeal before the master of the roles, Lord Justice Briggs and Lord Justice Christopher Clark. So this is really high up the court ladder, high up the judicial ladder, giving binding effect to the words that are in this judgment. We see that um, as a result of um, the intervention of the then Secretary of State for Culture, Media and Sport and Minister for Women and Equalities, Maria Miller, her representative, Mr. Myers, says it would be surprising if less favourable treatment because a person in the past was homosexual but it is now heterosexual was not equally prohibited. This does not require that ex-gays are to be regarded as a separate category of sexual orientation. This is very important. So ex-gayers was being uh, argued previously prior to this was that it wasn't didn't form a special category worthy of protection yeah but here the argument that is being made is that to be ex-gay is a sexual orientation and therefore worthy of protection according to the equality act discrimination against a person because of his or her past actual or perceived sexual orientation or because his or her sexual orientation has changed is discrimination. That is really important. Now, yeah. So, I mean, to me, that's profound as a person who has come from this background and working every day with people who kind of feel marginalized in the society. For us, that is a, a, um, an answer in terms of who we are and the and the place we occupy in society now my understanding is that therefore ex-gay or former lgbt whatever however you want to put it functions like a protected characteristic it doesn't need to be a protected characteristic because it is uh falling under the protection if you like of the equality act of 2000 and 10 in Great Britain. That's absolutely right, Michael. And what is extraordinary is that this was set by the senior judges in Milan, the master of the roles. So, so Andrea, this is my question. If, if that case was established in the High Court, I mean, it doesn't feel as though this is filtered down or recognized in in our society is it is it because this was you know the type of case what's happening here that this is not clearly in the sights of policy makers today well michael it's time for core issues trust and the christian legal center and others that were at the heart of this to really explain this to government to explain to boris johnson of course who was part of this case and I think he will be understanding this. He's lived through it. So I don't think that that is a coincidence that the now prime minister who was then London mayor needs to look at this again uh, because we were challenging his uh, decisions that discriminated against you at that time. So leading on from this then, do you have a comment in terms of the relevance of this ruling in terms of proposals to ban therapeutic choice or what is in other words termed conversion therapy 
it would clearly render them unlawful. It would clearly render them subject to legal challenge. And Michael, we need to be right there and ready to do that. Because what we know is this, that freedom to access the therapy that you want, freedom to move away from sexual behaviours that you do not want, the freedom to choose that, to access therapy, is uh, it's a fundamental freedom. It's a fundamental human freedom. And it is protected by the Equality Act according to the judgment given by the then Master of the Rolls, Lord Justice Brink and Lord Justice Christopher Clark on Monday the 27th of January 2014. There has been no case in this country which has superseded that one. There is no different legal judgment. That was an examination of how ex-gay as a category was protected vis-a-vis -vis the Equality Act. It's settled there. It's now time to remind people of, to remind the judges, to remind the government, to remind the policy makers. People conveniently get judgments that are against them or the culture acts as if it is subject to judicial precedent. So one thing I want to say, Andrea, is, you know, we put a probably quite a cumbersome statement on the side of the bus. That was our thinking at the time. Actually, we could have saved time and money, but by just saying some people were gay, get yeah. over it. it would have communicated the same thing. But, you know, we weren't actually in that instant talking about any uh, therapeutic approach. We were simply making the point that some people have a different understanding of, of who they are and they need to be protected and recognized in our country. That's all we were saying. But it's ITV News that said that we had linked it to therapy. We hadn't. We, you know, we believe in counseling. We, we believe in therapeutic approaches, but we were not proposing some wacky, you know, magic, exotic therapy. We were just saying that some people are in this position. It wasn't it extraordinary, Michael, during that period that the st stating that people were were once gay was deemed to be homophobic. Your very existence, Michael, people say is homophobic. The fact that Course Use Trust exists, that the International Federation for therapeutic choice and counselling this the fact that ex-gay out loud it says you are all homophobic you are all transphobic by virtue of your existence ex-gay you are homophobic for existing but of course you do exist it is a fact and all the buzz habit was seeking to do was respond to the stonewall ad which was some people are gay get over it and you were seeking to say uh, some people were gay get over it a statement of fact and that was deemed to be harmful uh, homophobic uh, prejudicial it would hurt the M londoners feelings and boris johnson we can remember full well came into the fray himself to pull those adverts together with his communications team and then denied of course that he'd done it but we've seen all the emails we've seen the texts it's changed we see that he was right at the heart of it. Well, it would be good to gently remind him of that, point out the law to him. And of course, here we are, you know, eight, eight, nine, eight years later, nine years later, um, ex-gay still exists. There are more and more voices. There are. Still more and more voices. Thank you, Mike. Thank you so much. Well, I think, in closing, what I want to say, Andrea, is thank you for your open-mindedness at the time. It took years and years, a great deal of time and money. But to get that outcome, really, it seems to me it was money well spent. So we're very much in gratitude to you. Thank you so much for joining us today. Mike, it's always my joy to stand with you, a man of courage, and to stand with all those um, that were gay, 
want to live their lives out in freedom. It's so vital. Thank you. It still excites me, Laura. We lost the case, uh, carried a, a great big fine against us that had to be paid. But we won, I think, in establishing the fact that you cannot discriminate against ex-gay people, that we too are protected under the Equality Act of 2010 in the UK. Did you have any response to that? Good news, Mike. It's tremendous news. I'm so glad about it. And also, I'm looking forward to Christopher Rossick's interview with you. Um, I, you know, I want, I am well aware, because some LGBT identified people have told me this, that they, if somebody wants to change their sexual attraction, frankly, they don't care. <laughs> Not everyone cares. So um, this is a, the activists are a group that apparently are very sensitive. And I think they're very, what they're very afraid of is the idea that yeah. same-sex attraction or transgender identity may not be invariably normal because uh, the, the um, homosexuality was taken out of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, transgender uh, gender identity, uh, this gender uh, identity disorder was changed in the the, um, the manuals on the theory that they're normal. And in uh, 1973, they argued from small pieces of research that would never be considered good research today that people who were same sex attracted had no more mental health problems than the general public. Yeah. But in 1990, research came out. We had better methods, nationally representative studies that showed, yeah, they do. They do have, not, not all have mental health problems, but they do have a higher rate of them. And so that created a problem. And then in 2003, along came the theory of uh, that stigma was causing their mental health rates to be higher. But now this year, the originator of that theory published a study with his colleagues. They said it's the best study that's ever been done. It was the first wow. largest population-based study that actually asked questions that were specific to the population of LGBTs and used methods specific to them and appropriate for them and found that over 50 increasingly and greatly increasingly affirmative years the men psychological distress in terms of de uh, depression, anxiety of LGBT identified people has progressively and inversely worsened, gone down. Wow. So the theory is not supported. There just has to be room for people who feel their same sex attraction or gender identity did come from trauma or other experiences that they need, they should be able to have the therapy they want and need, much needed therapy. And I, I just hope there can become a place in this world for all of us to exist. So in other words, Laura, we aren't listening to the research. We are continuing from an ideological point of view. And I think that's basically what we're trying to indicate here today. Now, I want to turn the attention in a slightly different direction now. We're going to have Dr. Karis Mosley come in. Uh, and she's going to, one of the things she's going to pay attention to is the role of Stonewall, because of course it was the Stonewall advert uh, that we mimicked in a way by presenting it in the same way, but having the opposite slogan. We, um, it, it, it had originated from Stonewall. I want us to listen to one more clip before we listen to Karis because I think this illustrates something about the role of the media. This was the second time I interviewed with Andy Wosley, or I think it was the first interview with him. He had, he'd featured in other um, things that had been um, recorded at the time. But it was interesting to me that there never was an interview with me and Stonewall after this one. Take a look at this. 
let's discuss this because with me now is Andy Wosley from Stonewall and Mike Davidson from the Core Issues Trust. Gentlemen, thank you very much indeed for coming in. Uh, Andy, I just wondered, I can imagine why you don't like the Core Issues Trust ad that uh, the ban was ruled lawful over, but it's freedom of speech, isn't it? I'm sh I presume you're in favour of that. Of course we are. And actually, you know, people are entitled to their points of view. Uh, what we argued people are not entitled to do, though, is to promote a very, very offensive message about um, a, a totally unscientific notion of gay cure in a very iconic setting, and this is what prompted the mayor's decision. Mike, what, is, what was your intention behind running that ad? Do you genuinely believe that being gay is something that can be cured or got over? I think, in a sense, we were really completing the continuum. Nobody is denying that some people are gay and have a right to be gay. But we were trying to show that there are people who genuinely want to move away from homosexuality. And that's not a criticism of gay people. It's their own right. Now, this was, though, I mean, you, your ad was identical in looks. Obviously, the message was completely opposite. But, I mean, this is surely something that could be perceived as fairly aggressive, no? We don't want to be aggressive, but we do want to make the very strong point that we need to be even-handed and we need to be fair-minded when we, when we have a debate. We need to have both sides and we need to represent both uh, very difficult positions that people in both camps often have. Andy, I mean, if you look at the Stonewall ad, you know, we're gay, get over it, that could be interpreted surely as fairly aggressive. I mean, the judge even said some people could find that offensive. Well, what we find actually is that people think it's a very positive message. Most people in this society accept that gay people are a part of our everyday lives. Uh, and the message is very, very important, especially for young people who might be growing up being bullied at school. And we know that over half of gay young people are bullied at school. Seeing that message, that very positive message of, you know, you're not alone, there are other people around you, is very, very important and very positive. And we merely come back to the point that had young people seen that advert, suggesting that somehow there's something wrong with them that they can change. Uh, it does nothing to help that situation at all. Mike, I mean, isn't that a very fair point? If somebody, a young person, as Andy mentioned, sees your ad and thinks, right, what I've got, what I'm feeling inside is something sinister, something not good, something that I really need to get over, surely their state of mind could be very seriously affected. I think it, it cuts both ways because I think if an individual wants to move away from homosexuality he really needs to be given all of the options available to him. So a young boy in a high school in Great Britain who has homosexual feelings needs to be told one option is to identify as gay and to follow that through but other options are to consider the choices around homosexuality. You're talking about it as a choice. I mean, some people would completely uh, reject that. Many people see this as, as a completely core part of their being, that, that this is the way they are. It is not something to get over. It isn't a choice. For as long as I can remember, I had homosexual feelings in my life. But I also realized that I had choices around those feelings in terms of what I was going to do with them. So I feel uh, people in that position need to be supported and respected for the choices we make. We're not saying that people choose to be gay, but we are saying that there are valid choices that people have around. Andy, isn't that fair? People have a choice, a lifestyle choice is to some extent applicable here? Well, the science is very clear around this. Uh, every reputable psychological organisation, the, the UK um, Council on Psychotherapy, for example, the Royal College of Psychiatrists, say that there is absolutely no scientific basis whatsoever for the notion of gay cure therapy. And indeed, they're very, very clear that their practitioners are not to, to engage in this because of the distress that it can cause people. Now, Mike's a lovely guy, and you know I'm very, very glad that he's happy with his life, but the fact is that pushing out a message that tells people you don't have to be happy with your life, you don't have to be happy as you are, that's a massively negative thing, especially for young people who are so impressionable. Mike, you're shaking your head. I mean, isn't this, aren't you guilty of trying to bring about social engineering? Uh, we guilty of bringing about social engineering? No. I think what we are wanting is genuine debate where we can interrogate the issues, the important issues that I think Andy is raising. If it's really true that every single scientist in the country and around the world has closed down on this issue, then I would say case closed. But that's not the truth. For example, 
there are at least three former presidents of the American Psychological Association who have argued strongly that there is a very powerful ideological takeover of that particular movement. So surely those are the claims we need to interrogate and put on the table and honestly deal with. And where things are true, we accept those. But to close down on debate and call people homophobic or hypocritical because they adopt the position I have, I think is completely counter free speech and the freedom that Great Britain is known for. Andy, very, very briefly, one, uh, ten seconds from you. Well, I should be clear, I've, I've never called Mike a homophobe, and I, I, I hope you wouldn't think that I have. Um, what's absolutely clear here is that we are having this debate. We're on global TV discussing this issue. The place to have that debate is here. It's through the media. It's not from the sides of buses. OK. Andy Wesley and Mike Davison, we really appreciate your time. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for coming in. Well, Karis, you've been very patient listening to all of that. We're going to turn to the interview that we did earlier, and a good deal of that is going to focus on Stonewall. But is there anything you want to raise, actually either uh, you, Karis, or Laura? Is there anything at this point you want to say? Yeah. Yes, I would like to say something about the clip we from the clip we just saw. Uh, I think Andy believes that a reputable organization is one that he agrees with. And I think he may be unaware how many organizations there are around the world that support change allowing therapy. The International Federation for Therapeutic and Counseling Choice is a reputable organization as is the International Federation of Catholic Medical Associations, which has 60 plus organizations around the world. And, and that's just the start of the list. So uh, professional organizations, there is no consensus among them about this therapy. Very important point. Karis, I think also I'd like to point out that um, Stonewall have no real expertise in, in uh, psychotherapy or counselling. They are, they are campaigners. Um, I mean, if you look at their history, they start off as a charity and a campaign, well, a campaign group, and then we then became a charity to repeal um, a law um, that was passed um, in the 1980s to um, stop the promotion of homosexuality in schools. And that was about anti-bullying. And that's what I, you can see the human rights focus coming in there. But when you look at their archives um, and compared to some and other gay rights groups, they never dealt with the notion of conversion therapy that is now called until your bus case, actually. It's very interesting. It's only since then that they've declined to be interviewed alongside you, as you said, but have then um, made public statements and never, ever backed them up with any kind of scientific research. And they've had this no debate approach, which I know that we're going to be... Um, looking at um, it later. Great. Karis, let's look at your clip. Dr. Karis Mosley, it's a pleasure once again to speak to you. You're so welcome. Would you introduce yourself and tell us something about what you do? Well, I'm a, a public policy analyst and researcher for um, Christian Concerns, so I'm generally interested in uh, looking at government policy from um, Christian Angle. And I've been doing a lot of work over several years now trying to um, oppose uh, government plans for a ban on what they call conversion therapy, um, looking at the UK and also internationally. And uh, good news for us, you're also on the IFTCC executive. So we're very grateful for the time that you've given us in that. Thank you. Um, the UK government insists that it plans to ban what it calls conversion therapy. Could you outline perhaps the main influences that are behind this goal, in your view? Well, uh, you know, we know the history of some of the scholarship of that, but I think when we're talking about the UK now, the main organisation behind this is Stonewall, and I, I know we're going to discuss Stonewall later. Um, but what far fewer people realize is that probably the main organization that has been pushing for this all along, um, an overall um, ban for both sexual orientation and gender identity is Pink Therapy. And that is an organization that's existed for decades. It says that it had brought, um, or it had certainly um, promoted um, gay affirmative therapy in the UK 
And it, there is, their writings going back to the 1990s uh, prove that. They were involved in creating the first memorandum of understanding against conversion therapy for same-sex attraction. And it's, it's recorded in the press. And they were very involved also with um, getting other mental health professional organizations together. And they're also instrumental in ensuring that gender identity got added to the second and later version of the memorandum. And I think the fact that very few people realize this is interesting because it is, it is kind of documented and you can find out. And pink therapy, I think viewers should understand, it. their philosophy is based on queer theory, this idea that your gender is just a performance. Um, and they do actually, you know, when you read carefully, it's an evidence that these people, they realize sexual attraction can change and they can be sexual fluidity. What they value most is sort of LGBT subculture. And they've also branched out in the last few years since being emboldened by the MOU to um, other things like polyamory and sadomasochism as well. Well, could we stay for a few minutes with Stonewall in particular? Yes. Uh, because it's been in the news so much. I've noticed there are court cases that they are um, basically driving and there are also cases against them. But could you say something about what we should make of what we're seeing in the news in terms of Stonewall? Well, I think it's extraordinary. Um, it's a tsunami, really, of, of organizations starting to see they're leaving. Every few days, there's a new story or a new controversy. Um, something I think something like half of Stonewall's income comes from um, institutions' membership of its Diversity Champions program, which this this program to advance equality as it sees in the workplace. And these organizations, including many government departments, have been paying money to sign up to their training and, and get advice on how to write their policies on gender and sexuality. Um, and of course, they've come into scrutiny because um, it was deemed to have given incorrect or um, advice on uh, the exemptions on single sex provision and defense of sex as a characteristic under the Equality Act. And, and um, that was a long time coming. Um, but I think if we're thinking in the term, context of the conversion therapy controversy, well, several of the bodies that have been members of Stonewall um, have been pushing for a ban. So the Department of Health, of course, as we know, um, NHS England is a signatory of the memorandum. Public Health England had told Parliament it wanted a ban and the General Medical Council. And now I think the Department of Health is rethinking um, it's obvious, you know, that it should be. And Public Health England, I think that's going to be transformed into or, or broken up into different new institutions. And so it's, I don't think it's renewed its membership. NHS England is saying nothing, which is interesting, um, perhaps because of its links to gender clinics um, and, and the fact that there's the review of gender services, the cash review for children at the moment. Whereas the General Medical Council has been a member since 2009. Um, so, I mean, all these are very different types of organizations, but the, the world of healthcare is starting to be split over its view of Stonewall. And I think that's bound to affect the campaigning. And I think the, the most important thing to say is because Stonewall is the main NGO doing the campaigning for a ban, and now government is starting to turn against it, where will that leave Stonewall when it comes to advising the government? It doesn't even want a public consultation, which the government has promised for September. But now there were other organizations, not only Stonewall, that was that were encouraging conversion therapy bans. Um, mm -hmm. But I think you're saying that predominantly the impetus has come from Stonewall. Is that correct? In the, in the current form of the ban as a legal ban, you need to have a criminal ban and including both sexual orientation and gender identity. It is mainly them. I mean, last year there was that leak, if you remember, to the Sunday Times from the government. Yes. About uh, proposals. Um, and a source told the, the, the newspapers that um, the conversion therapy ban plan was to placate LGBT people. Those, those were the words that used. Or what could that mean but to placate Stonewall or possibly the government equalities office who would be supporting Stonewall at the time anyway? You know, something else that I wanted to ask you is what influence does the MOU have in terms of the devolved governments? Is there a, a link there? That's a really good question. 
I think, um, so the proposed ban would be for England and Wales. The Scottish government and NHS Scotland have signed up to the MOU, but other people's freedom of information requests um, have revealed that the Scottish government doesn't have a big knowledge bank when it comes to conversion therapy. It's purely ideological, I think. Um, and that's not surprising because the, the government's now disbanded LGBT um, advisory panel didn't include a single therapist. So of course there's not much evidence. When it comes to the Welsh government, they've said since 2020 they want to ban, and it was in the um, manifesto of the Welsh Labour Party. That comes from Stonewall. There was no history of campaigning in Wales. I live here, I'm from here, and there was simply no history of, of campaigning. And in general, the mood is that people don't like to step on other people's private lives too much because you could see it coming in a small nation. Um, but I think we've got to be very um, vigilant and watchful as to how the Welsh government, now that it's determined um, and has given Stonewall a, a lot of control over its transgender policy, by the way, we want to watch at exactly which policy areas it thinks it can work in. It might not be able to legislate, but it could do other things like provide guidelines and, and put pressure. Something else that I'm interested in is the fact that the 2017-18 National Survey, the LGBT National Survey, are very much um, mooted as something that was, the, I think, the largest study ever done presumably in this country, um, fairly seminal in terms of the evidence, etc., that it produced. Um, what's your view, briefly, about that? I mean, we did our own study and we looked at that, and I think it's important to just make reference to that. But also, second question, if I can just throw it in here, is that it seems to me that on more than one occasion since that report was produced, the, the Boris Johnson government has promised new research. And I think, uh, you know, more than once they've mm -hmm. done that. I'm not understanding the relationship between the prior research and the new research. Well, What's your point? Yeah, the, the, the research that they did fund, the Government Equalities Office set out to um, advertise for um, funding to the people really to come forward to receive funding. And that was awarded to Coventry University to a psychologist there called Adam Jowett. And he um, is the head of the British Psychological Society's, I think it's Psychology of Sexuality, it used to be the LGBT group. Um, and he was commissioned and, and the research design, uh, the basics of it were, were available publicly because it's really coming from the Government Equalities Office. They, you know, they can't stray too far from what they want. Um, and they wanted to have interviews with, I think, 20 over 20 or 40 people had to be all LGBT. Um, and so it's not wasn't just going to be on same sex attraction. They could it could also include people who used to identify as LGBT. And I think probably there are people in the government who didn't like that design because it's not conducive to a ban, as we know from looking at other surveys. Um, but also there's clearly dissension within the government about whether you should have sexual orientation and gender identity. As a lot of the people who support a ban for sexual orientation therapy. Um, don't want to ban for gender identity um, because a lot of those people are saying, well, a lot of the young people who refer to gender clinics for gender problems are really gay or lesbians. And so there's this dissension. And I know from Freedom of Information, again, that the Coventry University uh, um, research was with the Government Equalities Office last year and it hadn't been, uh, I think, approval for publication hadn't really been given. And I don't think it ever will be, actually, because of these dissensions. Now, I mean, I find that very interesting because I think our main criticism about the initial national survey was that basically it functioned in such a way that it would only invite LGBT identified persons to um, submit answers to questions. Anybody who therefore was formerly LGBT and therefore may have benefited from interventions was automatically excluded. Now it sounds as though they, that, you know, in the background, that continues. Uh, if I've understood what you're no, saying, no, I think the Coventry University did allow people, and I think any experiences were welcome. But of course, you've got to ask why. And of course, we do know that. Again, I think this is under freedom of information. We do know that we know the government, um, 2017, 2018 survey, that there were some ex-gays who wrote in, um, and. Um, 
I think what you've got there is that the powers that be want those gay responses because they want to trace who gave them help. I think that's what's really going on. It's, it's never going to be admitted. You'd have to go to courts to find out, really. But yeah, I'm very suspicious of that. Well, it's it's worth watching. It's going mm -hmm. to be very interesting to see what happens to this Coventry research, basically. Yeah. It will be available perhaps under the 30-year rule, you know, that, that they have in the National Archives. Maybe 30 years later, it will be declassified. <laughs> well, watch the space and... <laughs> And we'll see what takes place. Now, the trans agenda has clearly come under very close scrutiny and has lost much credibility because of what's happened um, in Tavistock. But I'm concerned that with the, the split also that is evident within Stonewall, the emergence of the LGB alliance, um, that actually we're not seeing the rise of an even less questioned uh, normalization of L, G, and B. Mm -hmm. uh, would you agree with that? I'm not sure what to make of it. I think um, I've gone to the page, if I can just go to the page of the LGB Alliance. I mean, they write quite well uh, and they've done me, thought very hard about good communication. They have a page on end conversion therapy, which is, of course, the expression that campaigners like Jane Ozan and so on did not like. So it's not the same as banning. Um, now, the biggest thing about the LGBT Alliance is they want to separate sexual orientation from gender identity and sex. I mean, that's, you know, that's for clarity's sake. I think that's fair enough, although we should recognise there are sometimes overlaps. And I think that they are exaggerating the lack of overlap for campaign reasons. Um, when you look at their FAQs, um, they actually address this. They say, let me find it. Um, they don't actually support, they don't really support a world one. They talk, they say that they are against um, coercion. Okay, here's what they say. What if someone wants to change their sexual orientation? And they say, while an individual's sexual orientation may change during their lifetime, especially during an adolescent period of self-discovery, it is not possible to intentionally change someone's sexual orientation or to cure someone of their same-sex attraction. However, if an adult wants to seek advice from family, guidance from a faith leader in their church, or professional help from a therapist, this is a choice they have the freedom to make. So this is interesting. They're not some people who support what we do would say some of those things, but they, the focus on adults makes me think there's still a problem with their attitude to children. Um, so it's not clear. So. But then they say none of these people should coerce, force or manipulate someone in an attempt to change their sexual orientation. But they, meaning therapists, should also not be criminalized for providing someone the space to talk through their feelings about their difficulty accepting their own sexual orientation. So in a way, they've gone back to the original MOU, the Memorandum of Understanding. Mm -hmm. um, and, but I think there's a bit of tension underneath because they've experienced uh, the problems with Stonewall not necessarily respecting freedom of speech within the LGBT movement. And so I think they're walking on eggshells now. Well, finally, is there anything else you want to add or would like to say about this whole area? I think um, you should be with our eyes open and really with eyes at the back of our heads, not that we haven't done that um, over the summer because there's supposed to be a government consultation in um, September. And, you know, much can happen during that time. We've seen how fast things have ch been changing the stonewall, but I think it's going to be very complicated with organisations. Um, and ge there might be geographical differences. Um, so viewers will be interested to know, I mentioned earlier, the CAST review, the Dame Hillary CAST's review of gender identity services in England, but that should affect Wales as well, because NHS Wales really uses the NHS England's uh, services for gender, you know, this for children. And that's bound to have an effect. Um, I'm not sure if they've done a call for evidence or exactly how it works, um, but um, and it means it's not a public inquiry sort of view. But that's important to follow and perhaps to get involved in. Um, also, the rolling out of relationships and sexuality education in England and Wales and the equivalent in Scotland, I think that's going to have an effect. And I think those that want to ban will be looking at 
any legal loopholes or any anything they can any hole they can plug in schools because so many schools in Wales as in Northern Ireland have to um, I think they now have a statutory duty to make provisions for a child to receive counselling if he or she wants to or has mental problems and some of that will be for sexuality and gender identity and they actually do publish annual figures on this so we will have to watch what goes on closely with that. Dr. Karis Smosley, thank you very much for your input and thank you for all you do and for your writing, which I think many people find very supportive and helpful. Thank you thank very you. much. You can find all of these interviews as separate entities on the core-issues.org website or on videos.core hyphen issues.org. You'll find all of them as separate pieces. Laura, we are now ready to listen to Dr. Christopher Rosick. Any thoughts before we do that? Well, thank you, Karis, for that interview. It was a great interview. And um, I, I do think it is very important about the uh, professional defections from um, about transing minors. Um, the uh, research reviews by the United Kingdom's government, the U.S. government, the restrictions on doing this to minors in the U.K., Finland, and um, the new research out of Sweden showing it's not helpful. And even the research by the Endocrine Society and its six co-sponsoring organizations that include the World Professional Association for Transgender Health, all agreeing that the best available evidence behind puberty blockers, cross-sex hormones, and sex surgeries is that uh, the quality of the research for this is um, inconclusive, poor, very poor, or non-existent for various facets of it. So it's well well deserved that this that the um, there's a splitting off from supporting that. Um, yes, what's left now, I think the main thing is the issue of LGB. It's, um, uh, there's more, there, there just isn't as much information about the research on uh, that and about what even professional organizations are acknowledging about uh, trauma and uh, psychiatric disorders that may lead to and cause same-sex feelings or transgender identity also. Um, and there needs to be much more awareness of the research in that area. And I think Christopher's interview may help with, with that. Great. Without further delay, let's have a look at what Christopher said. Good evening, Dr. Christopher Rosick. It's such a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much for taking the time. Would you introduce yourself to the viewers this evening? Of course. Um, as you said, my name is Christopher Rosick. I am... Uh, a psychologist um, licensed in what 1988 I think so I've been around a long time I uh, serve in that capacity at the uh, Lean Care Center in Fresno California as a California licensed psychologist and I also um, have uh, for no some number of years uh, taught a, uh, a research practicum at the uh, Fresno uh, Pacific University, so I'm sort of clinical faculty there. I keep my keep at least one finger in the academic world, but I really don't want to immerse myself in it. <laughs> and I'm glad I'm glad I didn't. <laughs> and Christopher, our viewers can search you online, and they will see um, some great writing that you've done over the years. But I'd very be very interested to know what your take is in terms of the main scholarly. Um, uh, influences that are behind those who are asking for sexual orientation and gender identity bans. Could you say something about that? Well, um, it's kind of the, the same group, uh, of generally speaking, philosophically, it's behind bans uh, around the world. But in the Western context, um, you have a lot of mental health associations, um, which are, well, we can get into this, but uh, a lot of, if you, if you look at the MOU, of course, like any other document, uh, there are tons of appeals to authority. They'll just cite all these uh, associations as if that uh, really amounted to sort of empirical evidence in their favor. 
um, and appeals to authority are uh, something you have to be careful about in terms of uh, sometimes it conceals a, uh, a lack of um, real strong uh, evidence from an empirical standpoint, which is, I think, the case, uh, what we're talking about, uh, therapy bans. So in other words, if I've understood what you're saying here, people cite mental health organizations and executive statements rather than the empirical research. Is that correct? Yes. And of course, these associations have done their often have done their kind of reviews, but they're typically devoid of uh, diversity, uh, really serious kind of diversity that will lead to the best science. And that's a big, that's a big problem. And that's why the appeals to authority are, in my estimation, rather deceptive when you have, uh, go ahead. So in other words, what you seem to be saying is that there is kind of one ideological point of view that underscores all of the um, perspectives um, that are behind the therapy bans. There's no ideological diversity, no, no critical, no, no critique. Right. That's, that's what you're, you're saying. That is very correct. If you look at academic institutions, for instance, you look at faculty ratios of conservatives to liberal slash progressives, especially in the social sciences. Uh, I've seen statistics anywhere from, uh, you know, 15 to 1 to 30 to 1, you know, so conservatives are very outnumbered. Um, I am a member of uh, the APA, like obviously I don't speak for them, <laughs> a member of a couple of other associations, including the, the National Association of Social Workers. Uh, what I find interesting is, uh, like, just to cite one example, which I think is very characteristic, uh, you know, I've followed the, the National Association of Social Workers, Oh, since 2014, and they are one organization that actually does go on the record as endorsing um, candidates at federal uh, elections here in, in the U.S. And uh, over the last, uh, I don't know, four or five election cycles, they've endorsed, their, their PAC has endorsed about 640 um, candidates, uh, federal candidates. That means like for, gov or for uh, Congress, basically, or president. And uh, the, the ratio of Democrat to Republican, and of course, in a U.S., Democrat is the more liberal progressive party. Republican is, tends to be the more conservative party, or if there's going to be any conservative party, that's where the conservatives are. But anyway, the ratio is um, 640 to zero. So the NASW has only endorsed uh, uh, Democrat candidates uh, and no Republican candidates. Um, and I think that's kind of the striking... Uh, kind of drives home the notion that, that these organizations are unbiased. So in a, fun, in, in a, in a real functional sense, the NASW in, in these areas kind of acts as a, a, an arm of the Democratic Party, unbeknownst to probably a lot of, well, not a lot, but some social conservative social workers. I mean, this is a really major point, isn't it? This, this lack of um, perspective that is derived from different points of view coming together as iron strikes iron, we would say in other contexts, so that there's some critical perspective on these issues. I think that's vitally important. The I, other I, oh, go ahead. No, you go ahead, Christopher. Well, I, I just want to say I've become increasingly convinced that um, all, all human beings are capable of left to our druthers of confirmation bias, which is simply, you know, you when when research in this instance, anyway, when research agrees with your perspective, you are less critical of it than when research disagrees with your perspective, you're much more critical and dismissive of it. So I think this is a good place when you have a, that much of a lack of ideological diversity, you're going to have confirmation bias, which affects your policy statements, which affects your the research you cite. Um, so, you know, it's just not going to hit the, the, the other perspective is the conservative perspective is not going to be represented at all. Well, you can't, you can't have a, a, a accurate science. You, your science at best is going to be incomplete. I think that's what we're dealing with. So it's a lesson for us all, uh, actually. And be, uh, I think in the age of the pandemic, people have become more aware of the involvement of non-scientific factors 
in uh, in sci in quote unquote science practice, the practice of science. I know there's lots of stuff going on in the, in the U.S. about you know this whole uh, Wuhan lab theory and how the science in the journals and things were sort of covering that up back when uh, the previous administration uh, made the sort of gave the this notion that yeah this probably came out of a lab rather than just natural out of a, of a uh, you know a, out of a, a bat or something in a wet market but sure. in China so people are becoming a little bit more aware that science is just not um, uh, it, it can be tainted by politics increasingly Christopher, can we turn now specifically to the Memorandum of Understanding? And um, this is a very um, bold question, perhaps, but in your estimation, is this a scientific document? Um, not fundamentally. I mean, it, it doesn't, there's no, I don't think it tries to be. I mean, it doesn't cite any, there's no citations of literature, of research. It's, again, it does do the appeal to authority. Um, as if that was sufficient. Um, and it talks about checking the research and things, but, um, you know, there's, there's nothing in it that I haven't seen elsewhere. So it's almost, it's kind of uh, template boilerplate um, language. Um, and so so it, it has a political intent, uh, whatever else it has, it, it appears to be um, making claims, as you say, by appealing to authority, it's not engaging with any of the empirical research that one would expect it to. Well, not in a, not in a sufficient way, but I would say one way of putting it is a, it's more of a tribal document than, um, than perhaps a fully scientific document. What so do you mean by tribal? um you know it's our tribe we have a certain we have a certain perspective on this issue and so we are going to represent our tribe we will we will describe it as uh the science you know this it's, it's settled as if science was ever settled uh but in a sense it's tribal in that there are certain parameters about what we will accept and not accept what we will say and not say and and voices that we will allow in and not allow in you know if you're not in our tribe you're not going to get to to speak into this issue. So, you know, again, it's like if the National Soci Association of Social Workers got together with other organizations that all, you know, uh, were uh, recommending only left of center politicians and created a document, you, you would be very suspicious that you know, this probably isn't going to be a, a fully, gonna fully represent all that's there to learn about the, uh, the science of the issue. Well, it's a great way to talk about it, a, a kind of tribal document. I think we can understand that clearly. Can we back off a little bit now in terms of the MOU? And I'd just like to ask this question for clarification. What does the science say um, about the interplay between genetics and environment? Can you summarize it for us? when it comes to this issue when it comes to the issue of um dealing with homosexual feelings um mm -hmm. or gender identity issues in a person's life nature nurture um because it in this part of the world it seems that the media and some of the activists are very determined yeah. to paint a picture that we are born gay right right well, I think uh, among the, the scholars that really know this literature, although they may not want to publicize it, um, it's becoming more and more evident that, uh, well, the way it's been said in the past, and I would agree, is that you say genetics, biology, it can create tendencies, but it's but not tyrannies, right? In other words, of course, everything, every behavior has a sort of genetic or biological substrate. The question is, is it dominant? Is sexual orientation like eye color? Clearly, that's not the case. Clearly, there's a lot more going on. Um, and one cannot say in recent studies, uh, uh, genome studies, in fact, uh, were very clear that there's no predominant gene. There's involvement at some very small levels of a number of genes uh, by even the authors of this study, incredibly definitive. 
um, would say, you know, you, there's no way we can predict from genes who's going to be gay, who's not going to be, who's going to have same-sex attraction, who won't. So there's just a lot more going on. Um, and I, my always, I think it's it's in the service of political agendas to try to um, limit it to just genetics, obviously. Uh, I'd say that there's many factors that must go into it. It's more complex. Even APA would say that now, that lots of things go into it. And probably the, the relative weighting of these different factors is different for different people, right? So, so the Garner study, um, right. say something about that. Well, this was a study of uh, I don't know, half a million people, uh, something like that, um, of a genome-wide study. Um, and again, um, that was clear. I mean, I could read something if you wanted to dig it up, but um, mm -hmm. it was evident that um, the authors were very concerned that this was going to be used <laughs> by conservatives because actually it was very supportive of a conservative perspective that, that uh, there isn't just simply a gene out there. We're not going to ever find a gay gene much more complex than that there are there were like six different genes that had some very low uh influence in that association with um sexual orientation non-heterosexual sexual orientation so so yeah there's some genetic uh background but again um that didn't seem to be determinative in any sense of the uh, uh of my understanding and what i was reading uh, from that article now, I think in many people's minds, the whole question of the twin studies, and I think it was Bailey who did a lot of work um, on this initially. Could you comment on what that is saying to us um, in the fact that I believe what it's saying basically is that uh, identical twins don't necessarily um, accord well in terms of those that identify as gay. In other words, some identify as gay and some don't, and yet they are identical twins. What what does that say to us? What's the impact of that kind of research? Well, I think you'd have to, It's it indicates that it's, again, um, sexual orientation is uh, not like uh, eye color, right? If, uh, if it was strictly genetics, then you would expect, uh, if you have one identical twin, have same-sex attractions that the other identical twin have same-sex attractions and these two identical twin studies um, don't quote me on this but uh, I think the the level of what they call concordance of these two twins in their in their genetics um, is around uh, 12 15 percent something like that for um, uh, same-sex attraction in, in adulthood. So it's pretty small, again, uh, in keeping with this notion that gene, genes are by no means a, a satisfactory explanation, even if they have influence. Christopher, the whole area of um, sexual fluidity, I, I think I'm correct in saying that the largest group of non-heterosexual beings would be individuals who have mixed attractions can you give us a feel for research in this area is there evidence of sexual fluidity can we speak of yeah when it comes? Let me say this because this is something you find interesting uh the actually you know the largest um sexual minority category is uh happens to be mostly heterosexual which is an individual who has some mild same-sex attractions but by and large has also strong heterosexual attractions and can function heterosexually. And the study, the studies I've seen say that's about nine, those are about 9% uh, are mostly heterosexual, which is more than the, the, the remaining gay, lesbian, bisexual groups combined, which again gives sort of um, pause uh, to uh, bands of therapy, right? Because these are individuals who often are living very uh, heterosexually appearing lives, but they have some mild same-sex attractions and they might actually want to ad address those in, in counseling but nobody would know uh, unless they chose to tell them that they have those experiences so, so say that again they are the largest group outside, yeah, but, uh, outside of hetero, hetero right correct uh, the largest um what we call sexual minority group yeah. okay 
that's been identified, mostly heterosexuals. Okay. And so when you ban therapy for same-sex attractions, or, you know, uh, I guess I would want to call it uh, you know, sexual attraction fluidity exploration in therapy, that's the term I prefer. Uh, when you ban that, then you ban it for these individuals too. Is there any evidence of change allowing therapy harming people? There is no satisfactory evidence. There's no uh, good evidence. I mean, again, I suppose if you defined, well, let me put it this way, if you defined um, sexual change therapy or change allowing therapy as uh, aversion techniques, you know, shocking genitals, inducing vomit, yeah, then there's there's harm, okay? Uh, the fact of the matter is that stuff's not been practiced by in, 40, 50 years, even though it's still used as a frontline argument against or in support of these kind of bans. So when you're talking about speech-based counseling, professional counseling, pastoral counseling, that's, you know, that's informed anyway, uh, uh, there's really, I don't think any satisfactory evidence uh, uh, that, that the harm that they document is actually attributable to the counseling. That's the big issue. And uh, there is some very interesting research coming out. I don't know if you want me to talk about that, but um, that it's going to, I think, be challenging of the whole narrative uh, of uh, harm from from sexual uh, change allowing therapies. Can you just summarize it in a sentence or two? Yeah, we yeah. It's a study coming out. Uh, the author is trying to get it published in a. A uh, very uh, strong journal, uh, but essentially there was a study that came out in 2020 uh, that uh, was again another so so equals harm kind of study, suicide study, uh, and this particular this time, however, what was different is the data was publicly available, and so this this particular scholar I won't name him because I won't steal his thunder it will come out, but <clears throat> he uh, actually accessed it was publicly available he asked he asked for the data, and so he got the data. And then he did a reanalysis. He noticed that the, the study did not um, take into account pre-therapy, pre-soci levels of suicide, which is the big one big bugaboo in all this research. And so he actually got the data. He found there was a, a variable there that could be used to determine what the pre-counseling, uh, pre-soci level of suicide was. And then he reran the analyses, uh, including that variable, and found out that wow. That what this study said was actually inside out, upside down. Um, what they found was that suicidality was actually reduced for people who went in there when you took into account the levels of suicide prior to the prior to their counseling. That's um, so it does it does kind of lay waste to the whole narrative. And the fact of the matter is, there's no other studies that I'm aware of uh, of harm that have purported harm that uh, that look at and assess for the, the pre soci exposure levels of suicidality and mental health and those kinds of things. So, you know, that's research 101 again. And so if, if there wasn't a confirmation bias involved in the situation, this research would never have made it to publication, I think, because I think reviewers would, would have shredded it and say, wait a minute, you can't make these conclusions. You have no way you've got to control for these variables. So anyway, that's the story. Thank you. And uh, just for viewers' information, SOCI, again, is sexual orientation change efforts. I, I use that only because that's what I often have to use when writing for journals, where that's their acceptable language, but it doesn't really represent, I think, what you or I or people on this end of things would do. I, I do prefer the language of sexual attraction, fluidity, exploration, right? We're not, and that's what the MOU does. It says that, that we are telling that the clients what to believe, we are telling them what to do, what goals, we're setting the goals for them, hogwash. You know, it's, this is all about just yeah. listening to the client, right? The therapist shouldn't tell the client what their goals are, nor should professional associations tell the client what their goals are. Who are they to speak for the client? It's ridiculous. Exactly. Last question, Christopher, just yeah. in a word or two, <laughs> if such a thing is possible, could you say something about how you you would like to see the memorandum of understanding in the UK uh, review itself. What, what are the areas that you feel that it needs to pay attention to? Because it, it's going towards review, I think, um, in the next few weeks. I think I saw that. Yeah, I, I, I would like them to grapple with some of the more 
some some of this more recent research, some of it that we've talked about, uh, some of it that I'm, uh, you know, I've published recently. Um, one one of which really does make the it's not a claim, but it's certainly a it raises a concern that a lot of this research that's been done on uh, GLBT identified uh, individuals uh, does not translate to uh, individuals with same sex attraction who do not identify as LGBT. Uh, and all the research that's showing harm has all been done on LGBT samples, not on samples of individuals who do not identify. So I've compared it to saying, uh, we have these studies out there, they're studying, um, it's like studying marital therapy. And one group is studying uh, people who benefited from the marriage and are doing well. And the other group is only studying people who divorced after marriage therapy. And they're making claims about how how marriage therapy must be harmful because look at all these hurt, all these divorced people, all these people that didn't help them. Uh, but they're missing out on all those who did. And, uh, and in this situation, we're talking about those who probably overwhelmingly are not LGBT identified and who went on with their lives. And so, you know, there may be a minority of those individuals, but it's not insignificant. And and, nor, and those people still have rights to pursue the kind of counseling and therapy and pastoral care that they desire. So, uh, anyway. so uh, how we set up the research and where our population samples come from from are really important in terms of the outcome of the research. Uh, and I would dare them to have someone like you or me or other, a few others, um, join them to review the research, join them to do the revision. And uh, that, you know, or you, uh, because again, it's a tribal, it's a tribal situation, yeah. right? Uh, we're the wrong tribe, unfortunately. And it's well, very rare that you get groups of individuals from both tribes working together. Uh, so. Uh, but we need more of that, actually, if we're going to get to what the actual uh, true understanding of this should be. Well, Christopher, don't hold your breath, but let's hope that there will be a <laughs> in the future. Thank you so much. Dr. Christopher Rosick, uh, psychologist and researcher, author, thank you for your time this evening. Uh, it's a pleasure. Thank you. thank you. Thanks for what you do, Michael. Uh, you know, Mike, some things that uh, Christopher didn't say about himself are that he has published over 50 re, uh, research articles uh, or re review reviews and original research in peer-reviewed journals. And he is on an ideologically diverse research team of LGBT affirmative researchers and change affirming researchers working together. So what he's calling for he has been doing, and he's very competent at it. And I really would encourage the UK to consider him, the MOU folks. Well, that was a marathon session that we've had tonight. I think just to remind viewers, they can press the pause button and come back to something later, but they can get all of the interviews also on um, Core Issues Trust. And that would be one, I think, that would be important to go over. Karis, do you have any thoughts about what Christopher was saying or actually, indeed, anything in terms of where we've gone tonight as we draw to a conclusion? Well, yeah, Christopher talked about reviewing the Memorandum of Understanding and how that's due to be happening and so on um i i think you know there's been three versions now um and uh, one thing that nobody really talks about I and mean, i've tried to address it a little bit is when you look at the memorandum let me drop the latest version from 2019 we've been talking about same-sex attraction um if you look at the definition of sexual orientation in the latest version it says this, sexual orientation refers to the sexual or romantic attraction. Someone mm. feels to people of the same sex, opposite sex, more than one sex, or to experience no attraction. So romantic attraction um, and um, lack of sexual attraction, which Stonewall and others call asexuality, are now also coming under the MOU. And so therapy to deal with those is also now prohibited. Wow. And this has not been discussed in the press at all. 
I think privately there are some therapists who started noticing, and one of the reasons is that asexuality is something that Stonewall has been campaigning about. Um, and of course, there's no evidence these things are completely fixed. But to, to pinpoint romantic, non-sexual, you know, emotional feelings as something you're not allowed to seek change for, this is totally ridiculous. And, and, and you, I think what we need to think now is that is the MOU really part of a broader anti-therapy mm -hmm. um, approach? Because it's going to end up ripping apart all of therapy and counselling. And all of any religious pastoral care as well, if it continues in that vein. Karis, um, we, we, you said there were three versions. We know about the 2015, 2017. What's the third version? 2019. 2019. And yeah. am I uh, imagining things? Or at one point, um, were they considering the idea of therapists being able to prescribe drugs? Yeah. That's in the 2019 um, version. Of course, now that's being disputed because there are people from the British Psychological Society who've gone and complained to the charity commissions this year about right. it. Uh, Karis, the 2015 and 2017 versions said that a therapist may not help someone change same-sex attraction or behavior or gender identity or behavior um, that is provided based on a viewpoint that one sexual orientation or gender identity is preferable to another. Is that still in the 2019 version? The, the sense of viewpoint, you mean? Yes. I think um, that's a good point. Let me just see now. Yeah, it's, it comes up once. It says right in paragraph two, for the purposes of this document, conversion therapy is an umbrella term for a therapeutic approach or any model or individual viewpoint that demonstrates an assumption that any sexual orientation or gender identity is inherently preferable. So yes, it's still there, this viewpoint discrimination. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So I, to me, it's not clear whether someone who wants change for other reasons other than the, uh, an unapproved viewpoint can have it. For example, if somebody is engaged in a same-sex behavior or gender expression that, uh, you know, anyone could have a sexual uh, or a behavior that it is uh, illegal, unlawful, unsafe, uh, an expression of a known medical disorder. And if it's directed toward the opposite sex, they can still get therapy according to MOU. But it's not clear to me if it's directed toward the same sex that they can get the help or if it's a gender expression, can they get the help? That's not clear to me in the MOU. I, I hope they will clear that up in their review. Um, uh, certainly if somebody wants to change because they want to live according to their religious faith, that would not be an approved viewpoint. So this is clearly religious discrimination. Um, and uh, it's very interesting because it, it does include opposite sex or more than one sex, i.e. bisexual uh, sexual orientation. But what they want is no change at all. And so it, it, what you're getting is this complete essentialism where they, I think, I don't know whether it's trying to pretend that they don't want to, that they're not in favor of people going from straight to gay because they don't want to be accused of that. Because our side has made a lot of that over the years. It's just. Oh, 